Good evening, everyone. Uh, Kalisperasis. Let us begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Furthermore, don't forget the upcoming October Antipodes um, Film Festival. Uh, the program is out now, but tickets can be purchased for the opening night, which will be screened at the Astor, the Como, and even the Bourne Palace Cinemas. And there's also a theatrical performance, Life of Byron. We'll get you some um, uh, postcards regarding that event as well. So a very busy September and October. Um, now let's return to tonight's seminar. On the other side of the moon, constructing anthology of Greek outsider writing by Sydney-based Michael uh, Alexandratos. Writing, and more importantly, what gets published in writing, is one of the most unequal areas when it comes to the circulation of ideas, as often authors and content that are on the outside, on the periphery, tend to get marginalised. Such writing is important as it can highlight different perspectives. It can also be used as a satirical tool to demonstrate flaws within society. These outsiders normally write to explore powerful themes. They often focus on topics that are taboo or too sensitive, topics that society struggles to, to grapple with. So it's important to have both people and works uh, pushing the boundaries, especially historically. It is also important to tell stories that reflect the diversity of humankind. Today's presentation by Michael Alexandratos is exactly about that. He likes to uncover, to highlight, to bring to the surface writers and artists who may have been forgotten by history, by society. He seeks solidarity with the marginalised. One can say that this attempt at anthology is an alternative history of modern Greek literature. He'll be focusing on four individuals, the Gallocentric Yorgos Exarchopoulos, who lived in the 19th century, Plovdov Born, which was then called Philippopoulos in Bulgaria, the modestist Kostas Varnalis, the surrealist prose of uh, Mikhail Mitsakis, and the Lesbos-born eccentric Armandos de la Patridis. And a few words uh, about our speaker. Uh, Michael's a writer, researcher, and publisher based in Sydney, uh, Australia. He runs a small imprint, um, Kikladic Press, with the aim of shedding light on marginalised voices. We have some of his books on, on sale here tonight. I'm sure they will disappear very quickly. Uh, but you can always go to his website to order them as well. He strives to publish works of Greek literature that have not received the attention they deserve and has a commitment to highlighting non-canonical works and writers. Personally, I find it both highly admirable and astounding that such a young Australian-born person of Greek heritage has taken such a strong interest in what can be described as a niche, if not forgotten, segment of Greek literature. A big round of applause for our speaker tonight, Michael Alexandrovitz. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you for braving the rain. And I'll just get started now. Then, in the collapse of gesture and language, in the absence of grammar, under the word of times past, reborn, in the eclipse of correct meter, of healthy words, in the terrible flight of lines and sketches, we will wallow frightfully in impure lust. Written around the turn of the 20th century, this poem poses a few questions of what outsider writing is or could be. Is this kind of literature, as the poem suggests, characterised by the collapse of language, where meaning, association, grammar, syntax and metre break down? Or does this writing have more to do with the pathology of language, where words are no longer deemed healthy and where literature itself becomes a patient to be diagnosed instead of a text to be interpreted? In this talk, I will focus less on the exact definitions of a term that is still being debated than trace a kind of genealogy of this kind of writing within a Greek context. The basis for this discussion will be an anthology in progress titled The Other Side of the Moon, an anthology of Greek outsider writing, which ranges from 1840 up until the present day, even though I'm currently looking for more contemporary inclusions in the anthology. Um, this book is a collection of writings from individuals who operated on the fringes of dominant literary movements, 
the mad, eccentric, or otherwise marginalized writers who are linked by their distinctively outsider preoccupations, positionalities, and poetics. This anthology offers us a new way of looking at Greek literature, an alternative history or genealogy that extends as far back as the early decades of the Greek nation state. It is useful at this point, before discussing the writers in the anthology, to provide a brief overview of the development of the term outsider writing and its much better known equivalent of outsider art. The genesis of this term lies in the 19th century with the rise of psychiatry and asylums, which brought with it a burgeoning interest in the link between madness and creativity. This interest resulted in a greater recognition of the creative works of asylum inmates, which were readily dubbed the art of the insane. Parallel to this term were the writings of the insane, which didn't re receive nearly as much attention. A major turning point in the development of the so-called art of the insane was Hans Prinzhorn's book, The Artistry of the Mentally Ill, which was published in 1922. Although the focus of Prinzhorn's analysis were visual artworks selected from his collection of over 6,000 pieces, the book has notable inclusions of poems, writings, and speech by patient artists. The main conceptual shift with Prinzhorn's work was recognizing the so-called art of the insane not simply as curious oddities or as a diagnostic aid, but as being the expression of universal creative urges that were worthy of appreciation and serious study. The next development came from artist Jean Dubuffet's term, art brat, l'art bru, or raw art, coined in the late 1940s to describe his own growing collection of art from marginalized creators. And the major shift between Dubuffet's art brat and the earlier and more insensitive term, the art of the insane, was that the artists included under this term were not exclusively asylum patients or the mentally ill. This discursive shift is important as it broadened the scope of artists and their lived experiences. Among the mentally ill, Dubuffet singled out artworks from prisoners, spiritualists, the poor, the eccentric, and even anonymous artists whose work exhibited a raw quality that showed little influence from mainstream art and culture. Alongside Dubuffet's project of art brat was his own conception of its literary equivalent, écrit brut. Roger Cardiner's English language red rendering of Dubuffet's art brat broadened the range of creations and creators even further when he coined the term outsider art in 1972. Because the term was less dogmatic than Dubuffet's concept of art brat, it has come to include artworks and artists with a broader aesthetic criteria and lived experiences than Dubuffet's concept allowed. In the following decades since Cardinal's book, an entire art industry has emerged out of the term, but its literary equivalent of outsider writing never achieved the same recognition and attention. Today, there is a relative lack of literature and scholarship on the topic, a neglect which is actually striking, since many canonical outsider artists also had a significant writing practice. Now, when we turn our attention to the Greek context, the recognition of artworks and writings from asylums came quite late. The first person to take an interest in what we will now call outsider art and writing was the left-wing poet and writer Kostas Varnalis. In 1938, he visited the two major psychiatric hospitals of Athens, one of them was Daphne, which you can see on the right, and that was the public psychiatric hospital of Athens, and also Dromokaitio, which you can see on the left, um, and that was a more private kind of pain, pain clinic. And he visited these two institutions as a reportage for a newspaper. The full reportage and documents from these visits with accompanying illustrations were not published until 1958, and collect, were collected under the title Real People. As a writer himself, Varnalis was more interested in documenting the writings of asylum inmates than actual visual artworks, of which there are only a few references in the book. But apart from Varnalis, the writings of the insane were a missed opportunity for Greek literary modernists of the 1930s. Unlike their French surrealist counterparts, Poets like Andreas Empirikos, Odysseus Elitis, and Nikos Engonopoulos 
did not turn to the writings of the so-called mentally ill to invigorate their own writings. The next major publication in the Greek language came with the writer, doctor, and psychoanalyst, Nikolaos Therakoulidis' book, The Psychoanalytical Interpretation of Art. It was published in 1948 and reproduced arts, artworks from the previously mentioned Princehorn collection. In 1964, the psychiatrist and director of the Athens Romokaitio Clinic, Yorgos Papadimitriou, published his pioneering but flawed study, Talent and Art. Along with black and white and color reproductions of artworks by asylum patients, Baba Dimitriou also included a small but important sample of writings and poetry from patients that he collected at the clinic. And following these earlier efforts, the main collector and advocate of artworks and writings by so-called outsiders in Greece today has been the psychiatrist and artist Pavlos Vasiliadis, who you can see on the left, as part of his work at the Public Psychiatric Hospital of Thessaloniki and its Department of Cultural Communications, Vasiliadis has massed the largest collection of locally produced outsider art in Greece, comprising over 1,600 works. Vasiliadis was also involved in the publication of three volumes of poetry from writers associated with his Department of Cultural Communications. And now that I've finished this preamble, and due to time limitations which precludes me from discussing the over 17 writers in the book, I will begin by providing detailed descriptions of the four earliest writers and then briefer profiles on the remaining authors. The first writer in the anthology establishes a lineage for an outsider kind of literature that extends as far back as the early decades of the modern Greek nation state. Few details are known about the life of Georgios Exarchopoulos, a writer whose legacy rests on his only surviving poetic collection titled Poetic Tracks, which was published in Athens in 1842 in a cheaply printed 32-page booklet. In the solar, solar prologue of this collection, Exarchopoulos introduces himself as the so-called esteemed poet from the island of Amorgos, but we don't know the exact dates of his birth and death, only that he died sometime in the early 1850s. The earliest reference to Exarchopoulos on the printed record is from the newspaper Itahiptiros Fimi, where on November 5, 1838, he published a classified advertisement seeking subscribers for a forthcoming poetic collection titled The Orchid of the World. Exarchopoulos later published other poems in the same newspaper, uh, along with a series of comical news items relating to his travails in trying to get that manuscript publi published. Um, and it's apparent from these early articles that Exarchopoulos was a publicly known figure at that time in Athens and that the public were aware of his eccentric antics. However, it was the publication of his poetic tracks, as I said, in 1842, which cemented his reputation in Athens and in Greece. Written in an idiosyncratic katharevusa, full of puns, neologisms, and nonsense words, the six texts in the book have as their central theme the adulation of Napoleon Bonaparte and the solar majesty of France. Following the prologue, the first epitaphic poem takes the form of a lyrical dialogue between the poet and France. The poem was instigated by and written on the occasion of the return of Napoleon's remains to Paris in late 1840. But what makes Exarchopoulos' poetry particularly unusual, apart from its evident gallomania and rambling free associatory style, is his use of French-sounding nonsense words that are scattered throughout his verse. Among them are the words and phrases l'air baler, xifil maler, xifil galer, amfifil, fifil maler, and rev. These nonsense words are the most enduring and memorable parts of his poetry, and their fame extended up until 1923, when Photos Politis used them to satirize the work of Konstantin Kavafi. Exarchopoulos' pseudo-French also bears resemblance to the nonsense poetry of Lewis Carroll and Edward Lear, who were actually writing around the same time. Exarchopoulos' poems defy easy categorization and placement, is he a proto-surrealist, as some have claimed, a nonsense poet, an example of the polyglossic tendency amongst modern Greek writers, or an outsider writer? I argue that his Exarchopoulos' inability to fit comfortably within the narrative of modern Greek literature that positions him firmly as an outsider. 
The next major writer of the 19th century in my anthology, some of whom, whose writings can be reclaimed as brut or outsider, is Mikhail Mitsakis. Um, we don't really know exactly when he was born. There are various dates, but we know he was born around the early 1860s in Megara and was raised in the town of Sparti in the Peloponnese. He moved to Athens around 20 years old and studied law for two years and then started publishing uh, journalistic articles and writings in journals and newspapers. Despite years of critical neglect, he is now recognized as a major figure of the new Athenian school of literature in the 1880s and is well known for his urban short stories written in the naturalist and realist traditions. Although Mitsakis's recent reception introduces him into the canon of Greek literature, the writings he made around the time of his first mental health crises and later when he started writing poems in French exhibit literary qualities that are quite radical for their time and place. On January 7th, 1895, just two days after he was released from the psychiatric institution of Corfu after a manic episode, the short story Life or A Life was published in the newspaper Acropolis and in a strange and uncanny sense of foreshadowing, Mitsakis had actually written about his visit to the same Corfu asylum that he was actually institutionalized in later on, back in 1887. In this short story, Life, Mitsakis describes through a catalogue of adjectives and synonyms the different qualities of light as a carriage makes its journey to the old nursing home district of Batras. And I won't read the whole paragraph, but I'll read the first um, few words or so. So the piece goes, light sweet, light cheerful and light clean, light clear and light crystalline, and light lustrous and light shadowless, light immaculate, light splendorous, light brilliant, light beaming, light naked and light woven, light rough and light tender, light abundant, light tamed, light stricken, light fondled, light white, and gold, golden light, and light purple, light ablaze and light caressed, light boiling and ethereal light. And that goes on for another paragraph in his short story. And another short story that he also wrote around the same time titled Dovasos, The Forest, which actually wasn't published until 2006 in his collected works, um, features a catalogue of adjectives with hallucinatory and phallic descriptions of an olive grove, is also an example and emblematic of the shift in Mitsakis' style around the period of his madness. Following Mitsakis' seven-month stay in the Athens Dromokaitio Psychiatric Hospital in 1896, he largely abandoned writing in Greek, his final major work in the language being the 400-page manuscript titled Why, Viati. The entire manuscript consists of a series of sentences beginning with the word why, all featuring obscure puns and wordplay and which was written in between two years um, from 1896 to 1898. Following this work, Mitsakis began writing poems in French and in a curious mix of French and Greek. The main corpus of these poems was published after Mitsakis's death, with excerpts appearing in the journal Tanea Gramata, The New Letters, in February 1935. But as we can see on screen, another important and major source of his French writings are those he scribbled on over a copy of Homer's The Iliad, which was discovered by chance in a bookshop in Athens and edited and published by Angelos Karakalos in 1957. Mitsakis's French poems show a preoccupation with sexuality and eroticism, a theme which was otherwise absent from his previous writings. In one poem from this period, Mitsakis describes how under the Lycabetus Hill in Athens, standing against a plaster wall and in the absence of all being, he was castrated by a jealous sultan. Mitsakis is a rather straightforward example of how madness can affect the creative process with a clear shift between his earlier writings and those post-1896. But again, the categorization, like I described with Exarchopoulos, becomes quite difficult. Are Mitsakis' late period writings proto-surrealist, a harbinger of later innovations that would follow in Greek literature, or is it more useful to characterize them as outsider or brute? Again, I would argue that Mitsakis' late writings were estranged, both literarily and socially, from the period in which he wrote them, 
and occupy a place outside the literary currents of his contemporaries. Now moving on to the third writer in my anthology, um, Armandos de la Patridis, who you can see pictured on the left in a sketch. Um, and he's the most well-known representative of the kind of outsider characters that roam the streets of Athens in the early 20th century and is the only one we have a surviving collection of poems from that was actually published. And among these characters are Velopoulos in the middle, who preached the word of God and was treated for religious delusions at the Dromokaitio clinic, and Cleanthis Agalmatidis, you can see on the far right, who was the homeless itinerant poet of Athens. Della Patridis was born as Telemachos Dalakas in 1895 or 1896 in Asia Minor during the final decades of the Ottoman Empire. Around the time of the first purge of Greeks from Asia Minor, when Della Patridis was 20 years old, his family fled as refugees to the nearby island of Mytilini or Lesbos. As he was literate, he quickly found work as a public servant in a tax office. In his youth, Della Patridis built a reputation for himself as an eccentric and was also the subject of much ridicule, being described as, quote, simple and naive. He also wrote poems about an unrequited love, Fifi Yakali, who lived near the tax office where he worked. And according to friends who knew him during his time on Lesbos, this disappointment in love formed the beginnings of his erratic and eccentric behavior. He then quit his job in the tax office and changed his name to Armandos de la Patridis, developing political obsessions and aspirations, and would appear regularly in cafes and at the public gardens of Lesbos, declaring that he would establish a political party of blue and whites and institu will institute a ministry of love to instruct the youth in amorous affairs. All of these events on Lesbos culminated in the publication of a book of De La Patridis' poetry in 1924, titled Lesbology. Printed by the publishing house Neos Cosmos, which was one of the largest bookstores and paper suppliers on the island, each copy of the book featured the sig signature of De La Patridis. And here I have the scan from the front cover, which I'm very lucky to have found from a secondhand bookstore in Athens. It was his only published book of poems. And in the introduction to this book, De La Patridis writes that he drafted all the poems, which include patriotic, lyric, philosophical poems and epigrams in a period of only 15 days, and uses that fact to excuse the odd flow and clustering of ideas. Among the epigrams that he includes in his poetic collection uh, are these two, which articulate his own peripheral, marginal, or so-called outsider position on the island of Lesbos at the time. And the first one is prefaced by the words, for those of my enemies who sent me to the insane asylum, um, which I translated from the word Daphne, which is the public psychiatric hospital of Athens that I mentioned before. It was the name for that hospital. De La Patridis isn't fit for the loony bin, as you say. He's fit for a crown of laurels, but you for troughs of hay. And another epigram. In the company of my various enemies, all their gazes and thoughts have turned towards me. Yes, everyone. Others swear at me, others criticize me without me insulting anyone. On the final page of De La Patridis' poetic collection, he lists no more than 30 works that are in his possession and ready for publication. It is speculated that these works comprise the almost 800 pages of manuscripts that De La Patridis was also often seen carrying around in Athens in a tattered satchel. As of 1899, when the biography on De La Patridis was published, these manuscripts were reportedly held in the collection of Mavridis, but I've been unable to track down this hoard of manuscripts and I presume they are lost. Around 1925, Vela Patridis decided to move to Athens and became a well-known public figure, giving rambling political speeches, as I said before, as part of his party of blue and whites. I assume that's in reference to the Greek flag, um, obviously. <laughs> Um, his fame in Athens at the time is attested to by the numerous humorous postcards that bore his image and even an appearance in a silent film. And on one postcard from the 1920s, De La Patridis is heard proclaiming, 
«Ω Αθηναίοι, βγάλτε με και θα περνάτε φίνα, φρένο κομείο πάμπολα θα κτίσω στην Αθήνα». «Ω Αθηναίοι, βγάλτε με και θα περνάτε φίνα, φρένο κομείο πάμπολα θα κτίσω στην Αθήνα». «Ω Αθηναίοι, βγάλτε με και θα περνάτε φίνα, But amidst the political and economic crises of Greece in the early 1930s, Della Patridis's popular persona and the crowds who drew at his mock political speeches made him an enemy of well-known politicians. It is therefore speculated that the reasons why Della Patridis was eventually institutionalized in Daphne, the public psychiatric hospital of Athens in 1933, were chiefly for political reasons. And this brings us to the issue of Della Patridis's supposed madness. Even today, there is nothing to suggest from the biographical details of his life that he ever suffered from an episode of mania or psychosis, other than he was considered mad and had an obsession with politics. Although retroactively diagnosing someone from the past using our current standard is, is problematic, De La Patridis's case highlights the sometimes tenuous relationship that mental illness has to the category of outsider writing. Are the so-called outsiders in my anthology more linked by their marginal social position and their idiosyncratic visions of life and art than they are by emotional distress and disorder? Or do the, do the biographies of these outsiders allow for a term like neurodivergence to be used instead of relying on the framework of pathology and illness? Now, Romos Filiras, you, you can see on screen, is like Mikhail Mitsakis, is another writer whose status as an outsider is rather complicated. Most of his poetic output sits rather comfortably in the neo-romantic and neo-symbolist schools of poetry in Greece in the 1920s. And he was born in around 1888 in the town near, near Corinth in the Peloponnese under his birth name Ioannis Ikonomopoulos. At 14 years old, he moved to Piraeus and later, while still a student, he started publishing poems in per periodicals under the name of Romos Filiras. At 25 years, four years old, he entered the army and suffered from frostbite and returned to an Athens military hospital to receive treatment. But even at that young age, his erratic behavior became apparent when while still in hospital, he telegrammed local newspapers that Ioannis Ikonomopoulos, better known under his poetic name, Romos Filiras, has killed himself. However, despite these early signs, it was around the year of 1920 that his mental health problems started to manifest Um, as was documented in his case notes as the result of his syphilis. The writer Costas Varnalis remembers Filidas at the height of his grandiose delusions, appearing in the famous literary cafe of Zacharatos in Sidagma Square in Athens, and proclaiming himself as the Byzantine emperor Romanos II. <laughs> But it was in 1927 when Filidas' illness became publicly established when he published his so-called strange autobiography in a weekly newspaper from August 3rd to September 21st, 1927. In this text, Filidas lists his aristocratic yet psychotic genealogy, which includes Mary Antoinette and numerous emperors, kings, and sultans. A month later, Filidas was hospitalized in the Athens Dromokaitio clinic and would spend the next 15 years in hospital with very few opportunities for day leave until his death on September 9th, 1942. And the, even though he was incarcerated in a sense, Filiras remained quite productive during his asylum period, and some consider the poems he wrote there as his best work. It is true that not all of Filiras' poems during his asylum period have outsider or brut qualities, but there are a few that match what Gostas Varnalis described when he visited Filiras in 1938, as featuring lyrical outbursts, that they were disjointed, and that they exhibited a combination of the most incongruous elements. One of the poems that is most characteristic of Varnalis's assessment is the following poem that Filidos wrote in 1936, which was transcribed from a manuscript featuring unusual capitalization and equal signs. And I, the original is actually in rhyme and meter, but I translated it in free verse. Um, and I'll let you read that while I have a water break.
And as we can see from this poem, which again is uh, quite different from the poems that he wrote before the period of his madness, we can see how the process of madness can affect the creative process. But perhaps this is also a problematic assessment. The idea that outsider writers are completely cut off from the world around them and develop their own interiorized poetics with little outside influence or awareness is one that needs to be interrogated. Are some of these so-called outsider writers instead putting on a performance of madness via their writings? And what roles does agency play in the creative process? Was Philidas perhaps performing the role of the mad poet to his doctors and visitors in some of his asylum poems? Like Romos Philidas, the case of Lucas Sindelis also raises the issue of agency and possibilities for subversion in outsider literature. Nothing is known about Lucas Sindelis, neither his date of birth nor death, nor any biographical information. He left behind one book titled The Logic of the Insane, published in Athens in 1956, with the revealing subtitle by the schizophrenic army, army major. The book consists entirely of a series of dialogues between inmates and doctors in a psychiatric hospital, which I assume from the text based on references was Daphne, like I mentioned before, the public psychiatric hospital of Athens. And in the prologue to the book, Sindelis mentions that he spent four years in psychiatric hospitals and learned from that experience that the so-called insane are not necessarily a danger to society. Sindelis also expresses the hope by publishing his book, he's able to capture the sense of reality of the insane, even through the twilight of their frenzied delirium, the pure gold of their logic. The first chapter in the book, The Gospel According to Carell, consists of a rebuttal against the French, French surgeon, Nazi sympathizer and eugenicist Alex Carell and his book, Man the Unknown, which was published in Greek translation in 1948. And apart from being an example of Greek outsider literature, this book is an important and early work of anti-psychiatric thought in the Greek context, written from the perspective of those who have experience of mental illness. The book satirizes and critiques the treatments of patients in psychiatric care, including the use of electroshock, restraint, insulin shock therapy, and even the then newly introduced antipsychotic medications. And although Sindelis's book hasn't received much critical attention and can only be read in its first edition, a scan of which you can see on the screen from the front cover, in the early 1970s, underground artist and writer Leonidas Christakis published extracts from the book in his magazine Kuros, but I have unfortunately been unable to track down that magazine to see what his assessment of the book was. Now, Nicola Ostathis, also known under his pseudonym Paganini, is another outsider in my anthology on whom we have little biographical information. He was a self-described musician, poet, artist, radio scientist, and cosmologist. His literary output comprising the approximately 94 issues of his self-published newspaper, Paganini, which you can see on the screen. On the left, there's a portrait of Nicolao Stathis, and then there's another photo of him with his violin. Um, and the earliest issue that I was able to find was from 1951 and was in the archives of Costas Varnalis, who I mentioned previously. His archives are held in Athens. And I've also found an issue that was published on April the 1st, 1977, which I assume was the final thing he published. And I assume he must have been around or over 60 years old at the time. In these newspapers, Paganini writes, among other things, about how he can predict the weather, that he has found a cure for varicose veins, psoriasis, arthritis, and obesity, that he has discovered new electromagnetic theories and will overthrow the theory of general relativity, that he possesses superior knowledge of music theory and methods of violin playing, and that he can interpret dreams. Like Vela Patridis, who I mentioned earlier, Paganini was also another of the outsider kind of characters that roamed the streets of Athens, uh, but from the period of 1947 to 1960s. And he would often wander around the streets and cafes playing popular melodies and waltzes on his violin. And as I said, from, as can be seen from this photo, he also was accompanied by a cowbell and an umbrella. 
But despite being a publicly known figure on the streets of Athens, Paganini was also rather discreet and reclusive, and when invited to social gatherings, he politely refused, and there aren't really many anecdotal evidence of anyone having been his friend, so we can assume that he was quite a solitary figure in Athens. Costas de Valamonte is the only truly outsider artist and writer in my anthology whose work has received significant critical and scholarly attention. The writer and poet Nanos Valoritis described Valamonte as an artist of the periphery and the margins, an eccentric, and whose art he describes as primitive naive. Valamonte was born on the island of Lefkada in the Ionian Islands in 1911 to a Lefkadite father and an Epirotic mother. And Valamonte's experiences as a soldier fighting on the Albanian front in 1940 and becoming seriously ill with typhus were formative experiences which influenced his thinking and art. This trauma resulted in the embrace of irrational and delusional ideas as a means by which he could sarcastically critique a society that rejected him. Describing his occupation as a researcher and philosopher on his 1985 identification card, Valamonte, like I mentioned earlier with Paganini, had his own peculiar cosmological and philosophical theories which he explicated in public lectures that he gave at the Pantheon Theatre on the island of Lefkana. And here you can see Valamonte on the left during one of his performances. Um, but apart from these lectures, the other source of writings that we have from Valamonte are his um, uh, examples of Greek nonsense verse, which have been compared to the poems of Lewis Carroll. And his art practice, writing practice, and performance practice has been described as a kind of folk surrealism, exhibiting surrealistic and Dadaistic qualities without him being ever formally schooled or educated in any creative arts. Marika Palesti is one writer whose inclusion in my anthology as an outsider I am currently unsure about. Although biographical details confirm that because of her eccentric personality and presumed a mental illness, she occupied an outsider kind of positionality. I'm not convinced that her actual writings exhibit the kind of poetics that will be characterized as raw or brut. Born in 1888 in the Pontus region of what is today Turkey, she later moved to Moscow and studied at the, to be an opera singer at the Kiev Conservatorium, where she made her operatic debut at the age of 19. With the outbreak of the October Revolution in 1917, she moved to Thessaloniki and later settled in Athens. In the early 1950s, Palesti started to lose her treasured singing voice and engaged in politics, founding the Independent Democratic Party of Women, at whose rallies Palesti herself would give speeches with much ridicule from her audience. And because of these outbursts and ostentatious public displays, she was criticised and characterised as a so-called disturbed personality by journalists at the time. But as for Palesti's writings, we have her rather conventionally written autobiography, which you can see on the right here. There's a picture of her when she was an operatic singer, which was published in 1968 and features much self-aggrandisement. But she also wrote a rather unusual volume titled Why the Voice is prematurely destroyed, as in the case of Maria Callas, which was published in 1962. The book presents Palesti's unusual theories and advice for young singers so they can avoid a damaging their singing voice, using the case of Maria Callas as a chief example. However, this didactic is intention is used as a pretext in order to slander Maria Callas, whom Palesti was obviously jealous of, remarking in the book that it isn't even certain that Maria Callas finished primary school. <laughs> but apart from being an unusual treatise of singing while also a work of libel, the per book makes apparent Palesti's egotistical and erratic personality. And like Palesti, Babis Furnarakis is another writer in my anthology whose so-called status as an outsider is in doubt, but whose creative output exhibits many... Um, links to outsider art, writing, and architecture. His sole work of writing is a book entitled How and Why I Built the Castle of Fairy Tales in Agrili, a uh, cover of which you can see on the left over there. 
Um, the book outlines Furunarakis's reasoning as to what led him to build a gargantuan castle inspired by Greek mythology and history in his seaside hometown of Agrilos. Although Furunarakis claims to have had a happy childhood and describes how he became a successful doctor in the United States, he also characterizes himself as an eccentric and how his naive and childlike outlook full of wonder and imagination, compelled him to finish this castle complex. Now, Furunarakis and his castle can be called an example of an outsider environment in the realm of the Palais d'Ideal in France, which you can see on screen, which was a similarly mythically built castle by a person with no formal training. Um, and that's another one of the links that Furunarakis's work has to the concept and theoretical concept of outsider. One of the orally recorded texts from sociologist Maria Fafaliu's book on the Dromogaitio Hospital is a brief but notable inclusion in my anthology. The patient that Fafaliu interviewed, who for reasons of anonymity was called L, is a rare example of psychotic speech and glossolalia. L's drawings have the appearance of a private code with text written in an imaginary language accompanied by numerical figures and designs. Um, and there's quite a bit of glossolalia in this. Dorebri damik dalmel dalmeka, dalmel dalabalgalwel, dorebri dorebalagawel. And then Maria Fafalu, when interviewing this L um, person, says, all mine, yes, 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 all mine, in the fight. First, alpha, 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 200, 100, 100, scientific like that, yes, 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 good and nice. The artist associated with the psychiatrist Pavlos Vasiliadis, who I mentioned previously, explore the intersection between outsider art and writing something which is otherwise absent from my text-based anthology. The drawings and notebooks of Amalia Vandera, born in 1960 and who died recently in 2015, highlight the interrelationship between art and writing that is common to the work of many outsiders. Vandera was born in the city of Thessaloniki and after completing high school, studied a four-year course on biology. She started drawing after entering the psychiatric hospital of Thessaloniki in 1999, where she was diagnosed with a psychotic illness. Her drawings has been described as a personal diary of forms, symbols, and designs, which she, is, she transcribed and annotated from dregs left in coffee cups. For Vanvera, these images contain hidden messages that she tried to divine and interpret. She believed that from the southernmost tip of the Arabian Peninsula, as well as in the coffee grounds themselves, various substances emerged which contained messages. These messages were both written, in a sense, in her ink drawings, which we can see on the left on the screen, as well in the many notebooks she left behind. Um, and along with these designs, she also photographed, sketched, annotated, and interpreted messages from sources as diverse as television programs and yogurt packets. This image from one of her notebooks on screen on the right shows Amalia's quest to draw meaning out of word associations and their imagined etymologies. In these notes, Ea, the mythical island of Circe from Homer, is linked to Yea, the Greek earth goddess, and the word Grea, meaning old woman. And another artist from the Pavlos Vasiliadis' group is Thanasis Koprianos, who ex exhibits another tendency of outsider creatives to incorporate text into their visual compositions. Koprianos was also born in Thessaloniki in 1964 and started drawing and painting when he was young. And when he was about 20 years old, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And from that point onwards, he lived in the psychiatric hospital of Thessaloniki where he participated in many group exhibitions with Pavlos Vasiliavis. His paintings have a naive quality and consist of broad and rough brushstrokes featuring personal symbols and words painted in a combination of colours over a background that is either white or monocoloured. While working, Koprianos painted and drew without stopping 
and often on any surface he could find. The actual text that Koprianos incorporated into his compositions are comprised entirely of Greek neologisms and clang associations, the latter which is considered a symptom of schizophrenia, um, but I argue that they have instead uh, not a diagnostic value, but a creative value, um, even though they are pathologized as clang associations and common to the condition of schizophrenia. And now that I've provided this rough overview of my anthology, it is useful to conclude this talk with a few open-ended observations about the writers I've discussed. Why I think the framework of outsider writing works particularly well in a Greek context is precisely because of the long lineage and tradition of such writers in Greece. This genealogy simply does not apply if we are to talk about a tradition of outsider writing in an Australian context. Not only, not only is the tradition of so-called mad poets and writers non-existent, or, extend, or at least extending back into the 19th century, that have survived, um, but the writing and publishing industry in Australia has mostly integrated the writings of those who have a lived experience of mental illness and so-called outsiders. The framework and infrastructure of disability arts that we have here would also make a similar project of outsider writing redundant and even patronising and insensitive. And another reason why I think the term outsider writing allows for a retrospective reclamation of marginal writers throughout Greek literary history is because the term doesn't rely exclusively on contemporary diagnostic criteria. Uh, to be a writer living with a mental illness does not automatically make one's work outsider, as the term relies on a confluence of both political and aesthetic factors. Diagnostic criteria for mental illnesses, as outlined in the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, are also constantly changing and politically, socially, and culturally contingent. The Greek so-called Greek outsiders in my anthology, then, are not bound solely by disorder and illness, but by their idiosyncratic visions of art, life, language, and reality. Although these personal creative visions are common to all artists, because of the marginalized social positions of these writers and the estrangement of their poetics from prevailing literary norms, their achievements have been disallowed, ridiculed, and ignored. This anthology is an attempt to trace a lineage of so-called outsiderness that ironically allows for a means of inclusion and critical appreciation for writers who would other remain isolated and excluded from the narrative of modern Greek literature. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Michael, for that fascinating presentation. Um, I might just kick start off the, the questioning. No doubt you didn't cover all the writers. You said no, that. no, it's, it's still a work in progress. So there's a lot of even theoretical concepts yeah. and sort of terminology that I need to sort of standardise yeah. and, and in times, terms of how I describe their yeah. biographies. And you didn't and, have unlimited time, but yeah. um, when it comes to you know mental hospitals, um, mental asylums and so forth, you mentioned Daphne and so forth, another location which is most, let's say, Greeks would know, would be the island of Leros. Any of those writers associated with the island of Leros at all, the ones that you've investigated? As no, as not know? Leros. I think, um, who was the writer? Was it um, Kazantzakis' wife who wrote something on... Who? Galatia Kazantzakis, that's right. She wrote about, I think it's also called Spinaloga, Leros, isn't it? No, no, no. Spinaloga Different one. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But no, none of the writers are associated with Leros at all. Okay, because um, that's a well-known and fairly yeah. relatively large... There is a book in Greek on it that outlines that history, but I think it was only post... post war. Yes, that's right. Themos Gornados also wrote about it. Spinaloga, I think. Yeah. Um, but I think the site... Yeah, it was in the 1950s and 60s when a lot of the patients from the Romokaitio and Daphne were actually sent to Leros because they were so-called incurable... And, um, well, let us is another tragic history that I won't go into, but that's another okay. discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay. Nick. <clears throat> well, thank you for the presentation. It's given me um, a slice of life, life in Greece that I had no idea about. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, I was constantly wondering during 
your presentation. Uh, what are you going to do with this? And how are you going to do it? What is your intention? Yeah, well, the intention is to publish an anthology. Um, I want there to be... I mean, I've already um, compiled all the Greek texts in the anthology, um, but I also want to translate uh, and make an English edition as well. So, obviously, the Greek edition would be published in Greece and the English edition by another publisher somewhere. Um, but I think it's important, as I said, to draw that lineage of writers and bring them into Greek literature and the narrative of Greek literature. Um, although I said that mental illness isn't the sole criteria for a writer to be called outsider, it is one of the main um, uh, details in the life of these kinds of writers that, um, that are prevalent. But, yeah, I guess a sense of it is to sort of destigmatize these kinds of writers and not see them as... Um, fools or ridicule their work. I take their work very seriously and I hope that the anthology will also present their work in a serious way and with respect and admiration. Uh, sorry, in terms of uh, mental illness, have any of these uh, writers you, um, expressed that they have used this work uh, for their th own therapy, uh, therapeutically? For themselves, is there has there been an expression of that? Because there's a lot of, I mean, I've worked in mental yeah. illness for 17 years, but and there's always been art therapy, yeah, and uh, writing, and there's that creative expression is encouraged, yeah, in um, in mental in mental health facilities, and of course, as yeah. part of um therapeutic practice i think to some extent yeah. so the expression is encouraged very much so i don't know how that if that's the case in greece in um, yeah that time i mean frame. yeah uh, well or i mean it's just marginalized work and they said okay the the right of the the writing of the insane yeah <laughs> i mean Thanks. yeah well in greece i mean most of the writers in the anthology especially from the 19th and 20th century there was no such thing as art therapy in psychiatric hospitals yeah it's basic a lot of these these people in the anthology they were very much working alone so quite a few of the works were self-published um, they were not written in the context of art therapy or creative therapy it was more so an exp creative expression of whatever they wanted to express that they put out there that has also survived and now we can appreciate their work I mean it's not I mean it's hard to it's not exactly an anthology of writings for, about the experiences of mental health, but mental health is inherent in a lot of the writers that I've discussed, if that makes sense. Thank you, Michael. Um, first, I just want to commend you on what is now becoming a career. Oh, I don't know about of, that. I don't of, make any money from it. <laughs> of, I'm an outsider of, idiot. Um, well, then, uh, then career or, you know, uh, enjoyable life journey yeah. in bringing, <laughs> us, in bringing <laughs> us, you know, a lot of Greek work that we would never find. And so your inquisitiveness, your ability, your curiosity yeah, to head into these yeah. spaces within Greece is allowing us new insight. Yeah from this side of the world that we would just never have. And I think that there's another yeah. aspect there, that the, that the return of these stories back to Greece is also extremely valuable. Of course, yeah, so exactly. That's just the, a comment of commendation. But, uh, but, I mean, here, your work, this research, as at, at once you're documenting, at the same time you're doing extremely useful critical analysis. Yeah, yeah. And I... I want to then touch on, on one point that you kind of made, which is about <coughs> fully <coughs> recognising the marginalisation and your point about them being ignored and certainly not existing within so-called canon. No. Right? Even though some of the writers, yeah, they sort of traverse that category of canon and also the non-canonical. Right. Yeah, which is interesting. I think there's a really interesting thing to kind of interrogate here in the fact that bearing in mind that this is you have located an archive 
you are developing an archive, yeah. right? At the same time, you are still finding it, right? You're picking it up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's still... And yeah. I think that that's a really interesting question to consider is how this, these have been preserved, where they've been kept, how they've been kept. As obscure and as sort of random and it may, as it may be, there might be a really interesting pattern to kind of uncover that suggests that there's an alternative to the argument that they're perpetually ignored, that someone's listening, someone's caring. Yeah. And then, this is now the question, that's a point. <laughs> question then is then, through, through the presentation, you also have a visual archive. Yeah, of course. And it, it's almost as if, with, un, unless you find the text, accompanying the text, be it photographed or, yeah, or exactly. the art. Yeah. And I, I also yeah. think that that's fascinating yeah. to draw out. Yeah. That these, there, there is, there's this really interesting intersection between what yeah. we call literary and then, in inverted commas, broad, broad brush art. Yeah. Right? So there's this really fascinating thing. And so is that going to be in the anthology? Are you going to Yeah, have no, I am planning on including a lot of visual material in the anthology. And I think, as you pointed out very well, a lot of the visual material is essential to understanding the actual writings themselves. Not in all cases, um, but it is important. As I said with Paganini, I mean, you can obviously write about how he was roaming the streets in, with a violin and with a cowbell and an umbrella, but you, to have a photo of him actually in the process of doing that is something, I think, different that I think you can't capture in words and also w w works as a sort of accompaniment to the actual text. So, yeah, definitely there will be a lot of visual material um, that's been carefully selected. But actually, f as for archives, it's... I mean, the, the archive and library infrastructure in Greece is quite bad. Um, so a lot of the material I've collected, I've bought. Well, actually, not very expensively either. Um, there isn't really much of a market for these sort of obscure things, so I pick them up quite cheaply. Um, and then, yeah, there was a few things in Gostas Varnelis' archive, which is at the Genadius Library in Athens. There are the work, artworks, as I said, in Pablos Vasiliadis' collection, which I met him. He, his artworks aren't catalogued. They're in his private art studio in Thessaloniki. And even when I went to visit him, I said, oh, do you know where this, these manuscripts are? He's like, he didn't know. Um, anyway, he suffered a stroke. It was a bit hard to access. So you are sort of battling almost a sense against the elements and chasing up leads and anecdotes and meeting people. So it's a very physical involvement as well in the lives of these kinds of people and the artworks they may rather than just I mean you, you can't find them on the internet I mean is what I'm trying to say it's, it requires research and digging to actually find this stuff um, Michael thank you very much uh, I have to say you know that this is really great this is work because um, it had to be someone you know from the diaspora oh, thank you you know <laughs> to do that and uh, I think you know you are uh, uh, following the traces of Elias Petropoulos and others who yeah, had I to know, work so, from overseas, yeah. <laughs> you know, to uncover you know, all of these you know, stories you know, of Greece. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've got just a question now. Um, <clears throat> we know that um, in terms of writers, um, I have in mind you know, the two volumes, Thomas Gorpas. Um, Anthology. Oh, yeah, Kinoniko, the Black, Mavro, uh, Kinoniko. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, Mavro, Kinoniko, Mythistorima. Yeah, oh. Philidas is in that, yeah. Uh, there are some, you know, um, writers there, like Mitos Papanikolaou and all of them, you know, uh, especially in the 20s and 30s, yeah. you know, that they have been uh, connected with some psychiatric uh, institutions or something like that. Well, they were addicted uh, to, yeah, narcotics. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the other thing is, uh, I don't know if you, uh, are you going to use that? I don't know. Um, no, Mitos Papa Nicolaou, La Pathiotis, they're a bit, they're a bit outside the aims of the anthology. They work, okay. their poetry is very much in the realm of yeah, yeah. what I said, um, rhyme, meter, neo-symbolism, neo-romanticism. Um, and from what I've read, none of their work really shows the kind of experimentation or d even derailment of language that characterizes a lot of the kind of yeah, writings okay, in the yeah. anthology. So, no, they're not going to be mm -hmm. in there. Okay. And Thanks. nor is Zarkos, no.
Thank you, Michael. That was Thank great. You, yeah. um, I had a couple of questions, if we've got time. Um, the first one was just related to, I guess, the difficulties of translation, because you mentioned that you're working on, tra you would like ideally to translate yeah, them, and yeah. you have translated some of them, particularly the ones that are using rhyme, for example. Yeah. Um, what kind of choices do you make as a translator? Do you have a lot of kind of, I guess, practice as a translator that this is sort of... Um, that that becomes easier for you or is that challenging? Um, yeah. And I guess the second question was just related to this idea of um, outsider writing and to me what that makes me think of as sort of kind of like anti-institutional or even forms of perhaps esoteric knowledge when in fact yeah. what you're showing is that at times they are self-publishing so that and also you were mentioning with one of them this performative aspect. Yeah to the writing. So it seems to me like there's an interesting tension in a way between sort of otherizing but also in some cases perhaps a, des a desire to make their writing known. Yeah. Um, so I guess I was just curious, you did allude to that in one of your other responses, but um, how were these writings being disseminated? So you said there were some self-publishing, self but were there, was there ever sort of that they would find manuscripts after someone's death? That I mean, it was that's totally the classic hidden, sort of outsider or? scenario where a lot of these writings or artworks are discovered after a person's death and then we, and it's only then that we know that they had this incredible creative practice. Um, yeah, so some are from the Mitsakis one, some of them are from manuscripts. Um, a lot of them are self-published. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it pretty much is all from, like, printed sources, really. There aren't really too many writers in the anthology who um, whose works are from actual manuscripts. So it's all books, printed books, yes. pretty much. Which yeah. means there's a sort of self-identification as writers yes, as well, exactly. not as, you know... And you assume if they're printed people. that they want yeah. their work to be read yeah. and enjoyed and appreciated so um yeah but yeah the esoteric thing's interesting because um um i was also trying to see if there were any writings in the greek context of from i don't know perhaps what we would have elsewhere in europe of female spiritualists mm. who were guided by whatever f spirit or form or medium and wrote kind of automatic texts and that sort of things but i couldn't find any evidence mm. of that in the Greek context, mm -hmm. so it was unfortunate that that didn't exist. Okay, thank um, you. And yeah. the translation question? Oh, yeah, we the have translation time. question, yeah. <laughs> so basically the translation, it's a difficult job. I haven't even started it, to be honest. I've translated bits and pieces. I'm not... A, uh, I have an E for language, but I'm not a professional translator. I mean, but in terms of the rhyme and meter, it's, it's tricky. Um, and because it's such a work in progress and I haven't barely started translating the, the, all of the texts, I haven't really um, come to a kind of methodology yet with how I'm going to approach all of them. Thank you. Uh, most of them, the, you know, the people that have money or from a good family, they have some studies um. in that... Yeah, so, so to be able to publish your book, you must have money. So the, one, the other one knows how to play a violin and other things. Mm. The lady, she was opera singer or whatever. Uh, did you find any material for people from lower social I mean, economic? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Well, Mitsakis, Mitsakis was because when he became mad, he became homeless, essentially. And he was... Yeah, we um, can, but what was the background? For example, maybe the Romokaiti or the FNI or yeah, other yeah, yeah, yeah. institution, maybe they got some material because when I was in Greece, for example, I yeah. know that they got not really the, you know, like therapeutic, uh, uh, how can I say, groups. It's okay. No, it's okay. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But they they encourage them to do different things. Yeah. Like sculpture and uh, painting, writing. So maybe there is some material there. Yeah. The Romo Gaetio has a museum with a collection of about sixty artworks, um, but that isn't. Uh, none of the writers in the anthology so far are taken from any kind of art therapy process in a psychiatric hospital. Even the more contemporary writers, um, they've either, well, I mean, a lot of the, the two of them are in the Pablos Vasiliadis collection, and another one 
was published by the Vafni Psychiatric Hospital in like a sort of a self-release kind of format. But um, yeah, I wouldn't really, I, I, I want to work with texts that are already been out there or published or disseminated in some form rather than entertain all the ethical issues of collecting from actual patients. Um, yeah. And also another thing, also um, a lot of the, all the writers have a, a substantial output. Um, they have a body of work. So, I mean, it's not just one or two poems that they wrote and that was it. I mean, they have a body of work and that also merits their inclusion in the anthology. Um, Michael, um, are people in Greece aware of your work and has it been received? Sorry? Are people in Greece aware of your work, your research, and has it been received? Oh, they are. I mean, the response has been quite positive. Um, I did find a publisher in Greece, in Athens, um, who was interested in publishing the Greek edition. Um, I think I've had good experiences with this project in particular, dealing with researchers and academics. Uh, more, so with, more so than Rebetica, I mean. So there's a receptive audience. <laughs> well, it's true. <laughs> yeah. But the, yeah, pos yeah, positive, I guess, yeah. Any final questions before we bring proceedings to another? Close? Okay. Daphne? Thanks so much. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak a bit more to, um, I guess you expressed the challenge in finding more sort of contemporary voices to bring into your anthology. Yes. Um, can you just share some reflections, I guess, on what that process has been like and kind of what it's been like for you looking and trying to find those voices? So there is one writer who I actually contacted last week, Sotiris Michalakis, I think his name, he wrote, uh, he published a book in 2021 called The Diary of a Paranoid Schizophrenic. Um, so again, that was a book that was published. I didn't, it wasn't taken, as I said, from art therapy or any kind of context that would be unethical. And I contacted him and said, oh, are you interested in being part of the anthology? And he consented and got the publisher's consent. So that's one example. Um, there is another writer whose manuscripts are held in an archive, a personal private archive in Athens. She was a prisoner and she wrote these interesting diaries, which I've seen some photos of, but I want to see what other writings she did. Um, I'm not sure if she's still alive though. Um, and then there's only so far, and yeah, two other writers that are still alive that I've, whose work I plan to have in the anthology, but that's another consultation process when I'm in Greece. I mean, it's hard to organise these things from here. Um, but that's a yeah, brief overview. Okay. Um, Michael, thank you very much. And we'd really like to have you back in, uh, oh, in future you. years as well. <laughs> uh, just a small gift from the community. Oh, thank okay. you, Nick. Oh, oops. oops, sorry. And a round of applause for our speaker thank tonight you. and hope to see you here next week as well. Okay.